It's a, a great pleasure and honor um, to, uh, to introduce uh, Professor Solange Peters. Uh, she is uh, at uh, Lausanne University and everybody of you knows her because she is, even though she's very young, already a former president of ESMO. So yeah, we are the same age, I know. <laughs> I'm very young, so sorry for that. <laughs> very young. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, um, I'm just kidding. So you are really one of the, the, the you are the former ESMO president. Um, you are uh, one of the leading and very influential uh, um, um, minds in the field of oncology with a particular focus on thoracic oncology. We've just recently seen that you have presented the Poseidon data and many others, many papers, high impact papers. You are in the advice, in the uh, uh, um, uh, editorial committee, associate editor of Annals of Oncology and many other journals. And um, most important, you are a role model for young physician scientists, uh, such as Lena, um, who just recently um, presented work from, from our team. And I think this is very important because you made it to the top uh, of, in, in, in the field of oncology. We are extremely happy and honored that you take your pre precious time and that you uh, will give us a, a lecture on, on new treatment options um, after IO. And we are really happy that you are here and um, the stage is yours. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for the uh, too nice introduction. <laughs> um, but I'm very happy tonight to see also that you have built a program with, by the way, uh, and looking at our age, very young woman, right? Uh, so it's uh, it's quite quite nice to see that uh, this kind of session now happen with three speakers which who are women. I can tell you that when I started uh, oncology, it would have been simply impossible, right? So it's uh, amazing, and thanks for showing it as being so efficient and and nice. So my task today it's um, a challenge is to try to describe the new treatment options after IO. And unfortunately, I will spend some time to show you what we have been trying trying to do, we've attempted and failed, because it's also paving the way of, of innovation. We sometimes need to learn from our uh, our mistakes, right? Uh, and uh, I will uh, overlap a little bit and go for purpose fast when I cover the same data which have been presented in the previous uh, parts by the colleagues, but at least you will have some overview of what is happening or proposed after IO. There would be many strategies proposed frontline also, but I tried really to focus on what was proposed today and is proposed today after IO. So that's uh, where I come from. This is my discussion slide. So basically, after I hope, the main thing that we still don't really understand is how all the signaling in terms of uh, immune signaling and T-cell exhaustion, as nicely described, and the basis of two Nobel Prize is happening. We don't know about it in most of the diseases. Maybe the best knowledge we have is melanoma, but in lung cancer, looking at lit literature uh, before this talk, the total amount of samples described at resistance in decent literature, the one you have access to, is probably 120 today. Right, with, of course, lots of mechanism and different techniques, so nothing really to tell you about how this complex network can be characterized at resistance. So that's probably the bottleneck. So then we also have the diversity of what we use frontline, which might somehow affect what you have in second line, of course, combination with chemo, radiation, maybe now ADCs, antibody drug conjugate, but also a variety of anti-PD-1 on the top bar on the left, anti-PDL1 affecting the effector phase of the immune response. And on the right, a growing number, and I'm happy about it, of CTLA4, more or less uh, uh, modified in order to improve tolerance and feasibility, but a kind of a new paradigm for frontline strategies uh, in renal, melanoma, lung. So a mechanism of resistance might also unfortunately change depending on how you complement all of this. But the guidelines are this one, and that's why it's quite important to to think about uh, after IO resistance is all patients frontline, you know the guidelines, I don't want to cover them, but all patients frontline, whatever the level of PDL1, will receive a checkpoint. It can be only a checkpoint in high PDL1, it can be chemo and a checkpoint in chemo and two checkpoints in some patients, but they will all receive a checkpoint. So basically, most of these patients, apart from a very small exceptional subgroup of 20%, will be resistant at, a, at some point. This is a crazy table, and don't keep it in mind too much, of the ongoing phase three trials in, uh, in non-small cell lung cancer, including immunotherapy. So all of these trials are trying to pile up what we know. So for example, chemo IO plus a PARP inhibitor, chemo IO plus an anti-angiogenic, chemo IO plus a TGT inhibitor, chemo IO plus, a check, plus an ADC, sorry, chemo IO plus some new compounds. So it's kind of piling up 
to be better uh, frontline naive patients. So it will not facilitate my questions that I, my questions I have today, the answers I have to give you today is what to do next. Because the more you pile up in front line, the less you have in second line. So of course, my colleagues have developed, particularly Alessandra, that the main problem we have is first how to define resistance to checkpoint, and we need to have a clinical perspective. We have to understand one day or more or less time after time the mechanism of resistance uh, in order to identify treatment strategy. The problem we have in lung cancer today is we started to develop phase three trials for the bottom square treatment strategy before having defined resistance. So we have very heterogeneous patient population in clinical trials in second line and without knowing anything about the mechanism of resistance. So we have come to the third point without having completed the first two steps which is a real problem. Of course, what we also know when I was telling before is if you look at these curves of PFS, basically all the patients in this trial will at some point have this paradigm of being IO resistant. The small proportion of patients who are not uh, are, are the patients with a long-term benefit, but as you can see in both trials, it's a very small proportion. And, and that's how we, we qualify also resistance if you'd like to have a really clinical perspective in something we've done with uh, Maurice Perrol. The question is when you have your patient, you really have these patients that were called in the past hyperprogressives. They are just non fast progressors. They are just refractory patients. You have this patient with some not long lasting um, uh, benefit, having an acquired adaptive resistance, and you have the durable benefit, but unfortunately too small. In this patient population, after a free interval, you could re challenge the same IO. So I don't want to cover it the oligo progression, the free interval, then you can start everything again. But we will speak about the red and the orange today. And there's one thing which is important is you always wonder how much is it important, for example, to consider that patients are fast progressor or uh, de novo resistance, uh, refractory. So basically, remember that it's between 10 and 25% of our patient population that show no benefit at all for IO immediately. So that's really a challenge because we need to address it. And last but not least, um, uh, we see this table about how resistance is defined, about uh, primary and secondary resistance with the idea of having responses or not and uh, having the stable disease for more than six months, which qualifies some benefit than secondary resistance. But what is more important for me is the question you asked today is even more valid because all our patients with early disease will receive checkpoints in early disease, being consolidation in stage three or being adjuvant perioperative in stage one, two, and three. Meaning that the question today we have in advanced disease is the same question we'll have tomorrow for all of these patients who progress during the year of IO or even six months beyond the year of IO in early disease. So this will probably represent more than 50% of our patient population. We discussed a bit with that with the group of uh, Schoenfeld and Matt Hellman in the past and published a dedicating resistant paper uh, in Analyze of Oncology, which was really proposing this idea that if you have a definition of resistance, it's all these patients who do not present response, but more importantly, who progress within six months uh, after the end of IO due to the pharmacology. And I think we have to keep it in mind, this is one and a half year after starting IO in early disease. So driving mechanism, we have seen it about all the extrinsic and intrinsic, the pre machinery presentation of the neo tumoral, tumor neoantigen, but also all this potential regulation of checkpoints and interferon gamma signature, which all can drive this resistant phenotype. Remember that these data come from melanoma. And nothing, almost nothing of this has been proven in all small cell lung cancer, or maybe some little parts about the presentation machinery, particularly the HLA story in small cell, but very, very theoretical still in lung cancer. So what do we have? You asked me for a clinical perspective, so now let's go to the clinical perspective. ESMO guidelines published last year. Once you have given IO, whatever the scheme you have been using, you can give in second line, well, docetaxel, Nintenanib docetaxel if you have it in house, ravisirumab docetaxel, or you can give a checkpoint to who you have forgotten to give it frontline, which should not be the case. But it still happens in some country, I must say, because of, of regulation and approvals. So basically, this is docetaxel plus minus an antiangiogenic. This is the old standards on the left hand side, the Francis Shepard paper 23 years ago, showing that docetaxel is better than nothing, three months benefit. And on the right hand side, the changing paradigm of ravisirumab plus docetaxel, which which was never accepted even in Switzerland 
because the uh, survival benefit was considered to be non-significant and too modest, even if statistically significant. Remember maybe here that the response rate was somehow doubled. So there's still a rational to give RAM dossier, but it's difficult to get a hand on it, even in Switzerland, right? And the, the overall survival benefit is marginal. This is a dossier taxel based number, just to have it in, 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 your, in your eyes before we start uh, to see other uh, treatment options. A response rate to dossier taxel Excel historically is between 5 and 12 percent for a median PFS of two to three months. We have also the comparison with some other drugs, but if you start to combine in purple dosectacel and ramucirumab, you have 23 percent response rate for a median PSS of 4.5 months, sorry, and nintedanib has more or less the same. So keep in mind that 10 to 20 response rate plus minus antiogenic, three to five months PFS plus minus antiogenic. So very, very uh, small benefits. And then we have everything which we have been exploring and we are exploring in the clinic. So multiple checkpoints blockade. I will give you some examples at resistance. Some are also used frontline. But remember that when you test a new checkpoint blockade at resistance, the ideal would have been to know that this is a mechanism of resistance, that it represents a mechanism of resistance. And none of the checkpoints that I have uh, quoted here are known to be resistance mechanism. So that's very empirical, you will admit, right? Cytokines modification, this is about improving the T cell function and the NK cell function, sometimes also trying to reduce the T-Rex component. Again, very theoretical, and you'll see a lot of failure. Micro manipulations of, of the environment, adenosine pathway is a very attractive and seducing way to increase the immune response, but again, not a mechanism of resistance as far as we know. Antiangiogenic will cover it, and the colleagues have done it wonderfully, but maybe just one word about the data. Then you have this um, dirty uh, TAM receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, citravatinib, cabozantinib, bemesentinib, which have been tested too because they have also antiangiogenic, but this TAM, uh, the macrophage phenotype change, PARP inhibitors, and all the T cell therapy and vaccines. So we just cover what we know now and have in the resistant pattern. So targeting immune checkpoints, it's a huge number of small trials. Phase one, phase two, we made this review with Passaro one year ago already, but it's still valid. Lots of phase one, you see, and phase one, phase two, trying to see a signal in terms of response rate, maybe, of combining, for example, uh, an OX40, a GITER, a new vaccine, a team 3 by specific uh, um, in the resistance setting. But again, no, not a lot of data. So let's start with one of the chapter, immune checkpoint blockage. So we have this uh, nice review. You remember that showing what are the plus and minus. This immune checkpoint can be once you act on them, stimulating an immune response. Most of them are inhibiting an inhibitor, so removing a break. But you have uh, various types of, of potential uh, actionability of these checkpoints. So what do we uh, do? We know about the potential uh, uh, new. Um, checkpoints. So that's the list of what is being tested in lung cancer today. Uh, it's important for you. I'm happy to, to give us these slides to you if you want. This is what is now in phase one, two in lung cancer. So you see that's a wide range of potential uh, checkpoints combined always with an anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1, and a nice range of bispecific. It didn't make sense in the beginning to potentially to have a bispecific targeting maybe even two different cells with the same antibody or two different timing of the immune response. But at least the data today look interesting. So they are being pursued at resistance too. And we have uh, some bites, but uh, they are mainly now in lung cancer, in small cell lung cancer. And ADC, I will speak about it in, in the later time point. So let's look at one data set we had recently, which is Sabestomic. Uh, strange names. Huh? Uh, this is about this bispecific. You will have to get used to have the OMIG the uh, bispecific antibody targeting PD-1 and TIM-3. So the mechanism of action is quite uh, quite simple. So exhausted T cells to be reinvigorated, uh, as well increasing everything about the presentation. TIM-3 is supposed to really activate the dendritic cells, as well as all the antigen presenting cells in improving this stimulation uh, of uh, the non-exhausted T cells. So very nice principle of... Um, of, uh, of bispecific, again, TIM3 is not a mechanism of resistance to IO. And response here, i seen here. So some have said after the meeting of ESMO that this is extremely promising. For me, 
but it's rather on the field of potentially disappointing for this patient had a partial response. Uh, and uh, as you can see, most of the patient has progressive disease at the best response. So what I mean by that, I'm not sure that we really want to pursue it in priority at resistance when you see that. I need to say a word about TGIT because it's one of my main field of research. TGIT has been downgraded to one inhibitor of the CD226 signaling pathway, which is a very important pathway where the T cell CD226 receptor meets the CD155 on the tumor cell, which really leads to a stimulation. TGIT is an inhibitor of this interaction, but he's not the only one. The inhibitor of this interaction has mainly or see CD96 and PV rig on the T cell. So if you inhibit one, maybe it's not going to be sufficient to reinstall the crosstalk with the CD226 and CD155. So just to say it's more complex than what we think, but this is being developed a lot uh, in the in the field of lung cancer. Remember, some trials frontline, and it's not resistance, some trials frontline showing that in high PDL1 where potentially this TGIT mechanism is the most in action. Um, the uh, benefits of atezolizumab uh, on the uh, right is the benefits of the compound from uh, the DOM, the DOM vanalimab from Arcus, uh, which really all look to be strongly benefiting as compared to monotherapy checkpoints. So something frontline. So again, the question is maybe we can use it at resistance. The answer is again the same. This is not a mechanism of resistance to checkpoints. So it has been tested with Vibo, the Vibostolimab and Pembrolizumab for Merck. And as you can see, the Vistolimab of Pembro had a response rate of a very low, right? 5%. So a bit like I said before, most, uh, most of the patients did progress as being the best response here. So this is not uh, something to pursue at resistance. A little disappointing, right? So let's look at the microenvironment. Maybe we can play with cytokines, the adenosine pathway, and all of these drugs, which again are in phase one, in lung cancer today, maybe the list is not complete now because it changes every day, but that's what I have now, all targeting the tumor microenvironment uh, in, in the field of lung cancer. So what do we have? Failure, failure, and failure. So first of all, we have pegylodecacine. Pegylodecacine is a pegylating recombinant uh, IL-10. Uh, it is supposed to induce uh, phosphorylation of STAT1, resulting in a strongly increased activation of CD8 positive cells. We had a wonderful phase two with a 50% response rate frontline in these patients. So really uh, making people hope that uh, this overall survival PFS curve would translate in something wonderful if it's used uh, correctly. So again, this modifying the microenvironment. So pegylodecacine was tried in patients with high PDL1 with Pembro as compared to Pembrolizumab. It was making strong sense, right? But unfortunately, the Cypress one, this trial was perfectly negative, absolutely no benefit in any subgroup of patients. So then pepilodecacine has been tested uh, in the second line setting, right? It has been uh, also tested in combination with pembrolizumab in Cypress too, which was in second line, not showing a single benefit neither. So basically this is one of the mechanism which didn't work. Then you had another cytokine modifier, the uh, PDL1 moiety combined with a TGF beta Extra soluble extracellular domain. The idea is really to act uh, on the TGF signaling with this neutralizing trap and the PDL1 moiety. Very nice. It's called Bintrafus Alpha, produced by Merck. And uh, is again, it was tested first uh, in a small cohort, also at resistance, but frontline with Pembro versus Pembro in high PDL1. And as you can see, it didn't work. And what doesn't work in that setting of high PDL1 frontline will not work at resistance for sure, and it did not. Last but not least, canakinumab, it's an inhibitor of IL1 beta. It makes a lot of sense that IL1 beta could enhance anti tumor immune response by uh, the proliferation signal given to the T cells. Uh, and it came retrospectively from a cardiovascular disease where inhibited with canakinumab, this IL1 beta signaling, it was reducing the incidence of lung cancer and improving the survival of patients with an uh, unknown uh, found by serendipity lung cancer. So there was the rational, but uh, uh, also this incidental finding, I would say the other way around, first the incidental finding, and then somebody tried to find a rational. But unfortunately, a whole program of canakinumab, canopy one, frontline, canopy two, canopy neoadjuvant, canopy adjuvant, they all failed. This is something like billions 
terms of investment. And this is the one I wanted to show you. Can Akinumab Doset Axel versus Doset Axel in second line makes a lot of sense, primary endpoint overall survival. And as you can see, there's nothing less efficient than this one. So not a signal of efficacy. So all failed. All of these strategies have failed. So then we had to believe into, and that's something which was described here in the Ludwig in the past, unfortunately, how much VGF might be an immuno um, inhibitory, uh, uh, I would say, molecule or, or uh, uh, circulating biomarker, circulating uh, component. Uh, it uh, gives rise to um, uh, everything which uh, prevents the T cells to uh, go into the microenvironments to activate the, the PDL1 and PD1 blockade, as well as activating the T cell component. So, basically, as you can see on the figure, blocking the AGF with bevacizumab, for example, will allow the T cell to go into the tumor. It allows the T-Rex to be diminished, the MDSC to be diminished, the T-cell regulators to be activated. So VGF is a good target. And then you have this multiple kinase, as you can see here, this uh, what we call the TAM receptor tyrosine kinase, MER, Axel, and Tyro, which are probably very important in activating not only the NK cells, but also reactivating the exhausted T cells. So we have these compounds which are amazing because they are anti-angiogenic, but they are also TAM receptors, many receptors inhibitors, citravatinib, carbozantinib as examples. We had, uh, of course, for anti-angiogenics, this wonderful phase two trial, uh, which was shown uh, before in the previous talk, but remember that when you look at clinical data, you always have to look at statistics. So this is a promising, and it was nicely done in the editorial. Uh, this is a trial which is a phase two. This is presented correctly in, with an 80% confidence confidence interval, so a two-sided two, two 20% alpha, which is a lot. And if you were to translate this data into a usual statistical assumption, which is a 5% two-sided alpha, then the one would have been widely crossed by the confidence interval, so the trial would have been widely negative. So basically, this is a statistical assumption, which is correctly described. It's purely hypothesis generating, but if this trial had used normal statistical assumptions, it would have been strongly negative. So let's look at this. So I have a pragmatic trial looking only at OS with the same strategy moved now in the collaborative group in the US. But based on what I will show later on, I'm a little skeptical that, uh, that uh, it will be enough to have Ramusirumab to change the game. Because we had this wonderful phase two trial with carbozantinib, lenvatinib, citravatinib, which were showing amazing doubling in response rate and PFS. So it moved into, at the end, phase three trials, you can see here, versus docetaxel for carbo, lenva, citra. Carbozantinib is negative, lenvatinib is negative, citravatinib, I'm unfortunately the last daughter of the hope of it's gonna be okay. Uh, I made the trial, we focused on non-screamers because that's where we're seeing the most of this TAM receptor activation, the most important benefit potentially observed in the phase two trial. We had patients which, which, who were uh, had received one line of treatment, all have received a platinum end checkpoint. Some have brain metastasis, only 20% that matches the population of patients. So very uh, desired population, nothing excepting what we wanted, but unfortunately, no subgroup benefits. Uh, so there's absolutely nothing to observe uh, about it. And uh, keep in mind that all these recent phase three trials are negative despite promising phase two data, wonderful phase two data. So it's probably a word of caution that phase two are not enough if you don't have a mechanism of action that you can rely on. The, maybe one of the explanations that my colleagues try to always put in front is, oh, but the Dosset Axel are um, after IO, that's way better than the historical Dosset Axel. So the problem is we have made wrong assumptions because Dosset Axel is now, or chemo in second line is doing way better. Well, I don't know where this ID come from, right? If you look at all of these trials, you have them in the blue square. The PFS of Dosset Axel is the same as Frances Shepard in 2000. So we don't need to find a wrong explanation for a negative trials. It just doesn't work, okay? So then, uh, last but not least, we'd like to understand how we can potentially be even more expensive, nice, innovative, uh, and forward thinking and forward seeing. So of course, there are all these vaccines, uh, and this is a series of vaccines that now are being testing in lung cancer. We have the T, the CAR T. Remember the important discussion that what is CAR T, what is a TCR engineered 
set of, of T cells, what is TILS? So honestly, in lung cancer, we only have real TILS data in non-small cell lung cancer, which is uh, about, remember, taking a piece of the tumor, harvesting the TILS, fragmenting the, in order to collect the TILS, select the TILS, expand the TILS, conditioning the patients with cyclophosphamide, fridarabine, and reinfusing the TILS. There are some steps now where we can enrich for the reactive TILs, or we can enrich based on neoantigen and so on, but I haven't seen any of this in clinical trials. So it's a very blunt story, right? You take the cells, we expand the cell, and you hope they will do a job. So they did a job only in Moffitt hands. I'm not so sure they did a job in our hands at the time being because we do it. Well, in these patients who were refractory to nivolumab. They were receiving nivolumab in second line. They were refractory to nivolumab, meaning that, as you can see here, they were progressive at the best response, left-hand side. This patient had TILs harvested at baseline. So these patients were expanding their TILs and reinfused. And in this pink patients on the left, you can see post-TIL, 12 patients evaluable, be careful, but very nice swimmer plot. These patients were progressing on the nivolumab, continue nivolumab, receive TILs, and are pretty good in terms of a, a swimmer plot. And look at the overall survival. Uh, there's no update. It's a nature paper, uh, but still kind of a promising in late line survival and PFS curve. I think we need now to have more data and more centers to be involved. It's still not something which I have seen reproduced in any industry partner data set or even any academic data set. So we need to see more of this data. And last but not least, the vaccines. We are all trying to do vaccines. We are doing uh, uh, dendritic cell vaccine loading peptides. But more importantly, I think now the new generation of vaccine is Based on the COVID experience, uh, these are uh, RNA vaccines, which are moving very fast in melanoma, but also in lung cancer, with three new phase three trials upcoming in the field of lung cancer that uh, we will see very soon. It are still confidential. So I think messenger RNA might change the thing. And last but not least, so what to do? Uh, clinical trials, of course. Dorsetaxel, Dorsetaxel Ramusirumab, but maybe now we have an idea that we have a second option as compared to Dorsetaxel, which are antibody drug conjugate. That's the review we published with Passian and, 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 and Passaro, Antonio Passaro. You have everything in this review. A lot of ADC are being tested specifically in lung cancer with various targets, TROP2, HUS2, HUS3, CKM5C, MEDB7, H3, a lot of them, but we have one phase three trials. DATO, so TROP2 uh, directed antibody drug conjugates, DATO, Potamab, Derux, Tekken versus Dorsetaxel, primary endpoint PFS and OS. OS is still immature, I doubt it's going to be positive, but you had PFS. PFS is significant, had a ratio of 0.75, a modest benefit is still as good as Ramusirumab, a modest benefit, and here a doubling of response rates. So what I mean, it's quite interesting when you see this response rate from 12% for docetaxel to 26 for that ODX. Sometimes it's about symptoms in patients. What I find more interesting, there was a, co a qualitative uh, interaction p-value where the benefits were seen in non-squamous, but not in squamous. In squamous, I must say, the set axel was better. So let's focus on non-squamous. And suddenly here, your benefit becomes really significant. PFS is 0 0.63, response rate 12 to 30%, and duration of response is also modified. So if you focus on what will be registration, to my opinion, the non-squamous, then I think there's a value of that topotamab derux taken, and maybe uh, docetaxel has found a challenger. Overall survival is not positive yet. I doubt it will be, but let's focus on the non squamous and we'll look at it later on. Toxicity, it's chemo. It's a new way of doing chemo. The only toxicity that in my experience was really limiting is a stomatitis. And stomatitis with dato is not just a tongue or some kind of mucosa in the mouth, which is uh, difficult to, to manage. It's really a stomatitis going from the tongue to the stomach and patients don't eat and lose weight. So we need to start to handle stomatitis. We have not a clue. Should they receive PPI? Should they receive anything as prevention? Is there something to do with the microbiome? But anyway, stomatitis for me is a limiting factor in these patients and you have to keep it in mind, okay? SMOMCBS score is a score of three. 
using the form 2B. So it's not bad, not excellent, but not bad. One thing which we found significant in counting as a plus one score is a neutropenia, which is significantly less in the DATO uh, arm as compared to the Axel. So we added the one to get a three scoring. This can still be discussed. Ongoing phase three against Dorset Axel or in front line. So against Dorset Axel, you have the HER2 ADC, the HER3 ADC, particularly today against chemotherapy in EGFR mutated. So we have two TROP2 inhibitors, the sasituzumab and datopotamab, and the ruxtecans that you have seen now. And we have in selected biomarkers, CKM5 high and CMET intermediate are high. So these two also against Dorset Axel. So Dorset Axel has competitors, but at the time being only DATO or even docetaxel and ramucirumab. So this is what we had in second line. So now we have these trials ongoing, the sasutizumab, tuza, tuza, dato, tisle. So these trials are ongoing and in red are all the negative trials. And with this, I thank you for your kind attention. I think you know everything about after, after IO resistance. Oh, great, great talk. Uh, very, very dense and a lot of content. And I think, uh... We are really, we are really happy that you that you um, um, looked into the future. There's a lot coming, but many of these studies are all-comer studies. That might be a big limitation, and I think we will 